So hi everyone. Before we start today, I want to acknowledge with respect the indigenous peoples and communities whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day and on whose traditional territories all of our work takes place. So my name is Autumn Sipis. I am the Marketing and Outreach Coordinator with the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. And on behalf of the Coalition, Peach Health Ontario and Cascades, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Mitigation and Resilience, Hospitals Taking Climate Action. Throughout the webinar, please use our chat function for any technical issues you may be experiencing. Use the Q&A function for any questions you have regarding the presentation. And our panelists will be answering questions at the end of our webinar today. We will also be recording this webinar, which will be sent out to all registrants and will be available on our website and YouTube channel at a later time. I'm now gonna hand things off to Linda Verngu, the Senior Advisor for Climate Change with the Coalition and Climate Lead for Peach, to introduce today's topic and speakers. Take it away, Linda. And also a Program Advisor for Cascades. Yes, <laughs> so, that as well. <laughs> I wanted to just throw that in there. So welcome everybody. Um, our, our topic today is mitigation and resilience. And we know we have a couple of, of different facts that we can deal with here. One is that the health sector is contributing about 5% to our overall greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. And it's similar actually worldwide, about 5%. And we also know that hospitals and the healthcare system is is seeing the impacts and witnessing and feeling the impacts of climate change uh, from forest fires to floods to um, the uh, extreme weather events, for example, happening in BC and to extreme heat. So these are things that we need to be prepared for. And we also need to reduce our climate emissions at the same time so that we don't experience the worst that climate change can bring to us. So we have a, a, a great slate of speakers today and we will get right to that. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Nick Thorpe. Nick is the um, Network Director for Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Program at Healthcare Without Harm. And he'll be talking about the United Nations Back Program, a global program called Race to Zero. So Nick, take it away. Thank you, Linda. And thanks to the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm calling in from the west coast of the United States uh, in the state of Oregon. So nice to be with you all. I'm just trying to get my slides here. We will get going. Well, as Linda said, healthcare mitigation and resilience is, a, is an increasingly, increasingly important topic as we experience climate change uh, around the world. Healthcare Without Harm, the organization that, that I work with, has been involved in this work for 27 years now, uh, working to advocate for and support the transition to sustainable climate smart healthcare around the world. Uh, we started working in the United States in 1996 on issues related to healthcare waste incineration, um, mercury contamination, and this work has really expanded um, both in topic and in geographic focus. And it's really exciting to see this expansion happening everywhere from the United States to Canada to uh, over 82 countries that we work with in our global network, um, health institutions of all different kinds from rural clinics to modern urban health systems really engage in this work, looking to reduce their environmental footprint and also protect the health of their communities and the planet. As this work has, has evolved, Climate has risen as, as a priority issue for us at Healthcare Without Harm and for a lot of the healthcare institution members that we're, we're engaged with. Um, we see the issue taking different shapes in different parts of the world, but as Linda said, healthcare emissions are substantial, they're significant. And there's a paradox there that as we are, as healthcare is healing people, treating people, we're also contributing to climate change and to diseases that those people are suffering from. So we're looking to, at Healthcare Without Harm, help healthcare clean its own house, reduce its carbon footprint, reduce its climate footprint and environmental footprint, uh, also stand resilient to climate change, to be prepared for these shifts, these, um, these climate-induced situations, like some Linda mentioned, forest fires, increased severe storms, uh, heat waves, 
and things like that that are putting us on the front lines, um, but also for healthcare to step up and use its trusted voice to advocate for change, to, to advocate for policies, whether that's at the local level, a regional level, a national level, or or even an international level. So the work is uh, the work is important. The work is challenging, but it's also really exciting to see this work rising to a priority around the world in the healthcare sector. And on the topic of mitigation, uh, in 2020, we became an official partner with an initiative called Race to Zero that I wanted to share with you today. This is a, a UN-backed and created initiative that looks to rally non-state actors, um, so private companies, cities, and healthcare institutions to make commitments to, to target net zero. It's a way of saying, well, Governments are still figuring this out, still trying to figure out how they're going to do it and what targets they're going to set and if they can go to net zero. There's a lot of the private sector and public sector that wants to rise to this occasion on their own. It says, we can't wait for this to happen at a national level. We need to clean up our own house. Uh, we need to, we know that when those commitments happen, that we will be a part of it. So we want to get started on this journey now. It's been a really um, exciting initiative to be a part of. Um, healthcare Without Harm is the partner through which all healthcare institutions that are setting these commitments, um, setting these targets, and and reporting on their progress um, flow through us. And it gives us an opportunity to build a global community of, of leaders who are making this commitment to net zero, um, to form a community of practice, to support their connections with one another, um, and also to support the, the work that they're doing at their own hospital. This, as I said before, this, this work is extremely challenging. Going net zero um, across energy use, across purchase products, across waste management is, is really challenging around the world. Um, but we know the solutions are out there. We, we've seen them in practice. And what we're aiming to do is support a community that exchanges those strategies. How were you able to address your scope three emissions, this big challenging piece of the, of the carbon footprint of healthcare? Uh, how are you able to change the food that you serve? How are you able to uh, manage your energy in different ways? So there's a great exchange of information and we've been really excited and almost blown away from the response that we've received so far. Um, so to date in in around two and a half year, we've two and a half years, we've had uh, over seventy healthcare institutions who represent over fourteen thousand hospitals and health centers spread across twenty five countries join Race to Zero. Um, when we set out on this journey, it became a partner. I think we were hoping for ten, um, and so this really surprised us in a good way um, that we saw healthcare institutions stepping up to this challenge. And I think the important thing to to note here is that. There's some players involved here who we knew would join this, who we knew were already on this path, um, whether they be in the United States and South Africa or in parts of Europe. Um, we expected them to join this, this work and, and be a leader here. I think the equally important and uh, part of it is, is those players who are at the beginning of their journey, those hospitals that are just starting to measure their baseline for the first time, just starting to understand what their climate impacts are, are at the very inception of that work saying, we know we're getting started, but we know that it's important to target net zero. We want to go as far as we can in this work, despite not knowing how to get there. Um, so leadership at these institutions, whether it's hospitals in Mexico or Argentina, uh, places in India and Southeast Asia are, are stepping up and wanting to really raise that ambition as they get their program going and being a part of this global community. Um, so we've been, as I said, really, really amazed um, by the, the engagement of the healthcare sector around the world on this issue. Um, it's forming a community of practice that we think is the most important way to solve these issues. Um, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, Healthcare Without Harm, and lots of other organizations provide tr a tremendous amount of tools and resources and expertise to help understand carbon footprints, mitigate them, 
but we really think the val the, the true value is in the community. It's in all of the hospitals out there in the world doing this work who are innovating, um, doing creative investing, and, and really developing solutions on the ground that can work. And so our goal here is to is to not only support from a technical side, but it's really to facilitate a network coming together of, of leaders around the world. Uh, all the countries here marked in purple are, are part of Race to Zero. You'll see uh, we do not yet have a participant from Canada, but we would love to welcome uh, any healthcare institutions doing this work, which we know there are many that are engaged in, in mitigation and resilience to, to join Race to Zero and join this international group uh, and really elevate your commitment and, and be a part of uh, a global movement. I think the, the big, one of the big benefits of being part of Race to Zero and the fact that it's aligned with, with the United Nations is, is they are looking to elevate our stories. They are looking to celebrate our success, showcase the work that's happening uh, at healthcare institutions around the world and, and move that into advocacy, um, move that to saying, well, how can we invent policies? How can we support these connections with the World Health Organization or other United Nations departments or ministries of health to say, this work is happening by healthcare institutions taking it on on their own. But it would be that much more powerful if we had policies and regulations and financing that could allow this work to happen. Um, so we invite any, any healthcare institutions that would be interested, that are engaged in this work, that are just getting started, but see the importance of going to net zero um, to join us. And as I mentioned, we're providing a, a, a variety of resources to support hospitals in this work. Um, one of them is the program that I manage called Global Green and Healthy Hospitals, which is a international network of members um, spread across 82 countries who are engaged in this work. Through that, through that program, which is a, a free membership, we offer a variety of tools and resources focused on climate, um, from carbon footprint measurement tools to guidance documents on how to address climate and sustainability on topics such as chemicals and procurement, uh, food, energy use, building design. And again, I think the core, the core benefit that we can provide and that we can all do together is, 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 is facilitating a community and a connection to learn from one another, to understand what strategies work, what, what strategies have not worked, and, and really accelerate this work together and really form a powerful voice uh, to advocate for this change that we want to see, not only in hospitals in our uh, where we live, but in hospitals around our countries, our regions, uh, around and around the world. Um, while it is a race to zero, this race is not something that there's a first place, a second place, and a third place. This is a race that we can only win by doing it together, and doing it in collaboration with one another, and and doing it in a way that we can get there as fast as possible. I think that's what we learn continually is that the race is on and we need to accelerate this change as much as we can in our home countries and around the world. So for any, again, for any institutions looking to join uh, and, or learn more, more about Race to Zero and the work that we're doing in this space, um, we invite you to, to check out our websites where we have information on it and, and contact us at any time. And again, thank you for the to the Canadian Coalition for the opportunity to join and share this opportunity and looking forward to hearing from others about how this work is taking place already in Canada. So thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, it's uh, great to hear about the race to uh, to zero. And uh, I think most of the people on this call will will probably find it of, of interest uh, and maybe they haven't heard about it before. So thanks so much. We will have time for questions at the end. So I would like to move forward with the next presentation. And the next presentation will be about Sus de Laval's um, uh, climate change uh, work that they've done on the analysis to estimate their scope one, two, and three emissions. And um, to do this presentation, we have Benoit Lalonde, who is the Associate Director of Technical Services at Suisse de Laval, and we have Jerome Ribas, who is the Associate uh, Director at Synergy Santé Environment. So I welcome both of you to, uh, to take the stage. Thank you, Linda. So I'll share my screen. Thank you, uh, everybody, for your time. Um, 
I want to take a few minutes with my colleague and uh, partner in this uh, in this crime, Jérôme, to 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 discuss with you about a very good project that we had within our organization in terms of carbon footprint evaluation and all the benefit that it brought to the um, to the organization. So. I'll start, uh, we'll be doing it. Uh, I'm going to do uh, share the presentation with Jérôme. I'm going to start with the context, the objective, the methodology. Uh, the objective, uh, Jérôme will follow with the methodology, perimeter, and the result, and I'll end up with the, uh, the next steps. So for everybody out of the province of Quebec, CIS de Laval stands for Integrated Health and Social Services Center, which is basically um, trying to have an organization giving healthcare services from your first day to your last day. So uh, a group of buildings that provide all the type of mission in terms of healthcare uh, services, which start with the uh, at the hospital, uh, local services, a long term, long -term term care services, um, readaptation center, youth center, and everything. So everything within the same organization. That, so we're all we're giving all the health care services within the, uh, the, the city of Laval in province of Quebec. So variety of buildings, everything uh, that we put together, it's uh, difficult to call uh, to uh, to uh, to compare in terms of impact on the environment. So we were always looking at how we can compare, how we can make sure we can make sure that uh, we uh, target the good work, the, the most important one in terms of uh, impact on the environment. So within our organization, we have a, a sustainable development committee, which is quite dis decentralized in many subcommittee which work on a specific area or specific task to make sure that we improve our uh, our footprint in terms of uh, mm. on the impact on the environment. Benoit, but, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you uh, share your slides? Oh, I thought it was already done. I'm sorry. No, it's not up. If you could just do that, that'd be terrific. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I thought it was already done. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, there it is. We're good now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Technical problem with me. I'm sorry. So how do we properly prioritize the investment and how we choose from one, uh, one project or the others on the impact? So we had always this, uh, this question in terms of the decision making, because probably as you all uh, live the situation, uh, not enough uh, resources, not enough time, not enough money to uh, to do everything that we want. So what what will be project one, project two, project three? So we obtain a grant from the rationalization fund of the healthcare system, which help us put this put in place this project of reviewing our uh, carbon footprint. And we did it with all those partners, so the healthcare uh, department, the Primum Non Nocere, and SSE Environnement, which is led by uh, Gérald. This is the, um, the structure of our environmental uh, committee. So we have the main one here where we um, take all the Import the decision on uh, prioritization and everything that needs to be put in place with with transvents uh, uh, different type of services. We have the medical sustainable committee, which uh, emphasizes work on what the impact on the medical services that are given and how we can change things to make sure that we reduce our impact. And we have more operational uh, subcommittee. Uh, working on the uh, food services systems, the building, which uh, uh, consumption of water, heat systems and uh, energy, uh, the biodiversity, um, uh, sourcing our everything that we purchase, what the impact and how can we have a benefit in terms of environmental impact, the residual materials and the mobility. So the objective of this project was to quantify the environmental impact 
and in how we could improve our uh, our way in terms of environmental impact within uh, within the organization. So oh, I will take the lead now. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, Benoit, uh, for the, the introduction. So uh, the, the methodology we used uh, is based on the uh, carbon footprint uh, method uh, of the ADEM. So it's uh, the, the French uh, Energy Agency. Um, uh, we decided to use it because we, we work with uh, French colleagues that were, uh, you know, used to do carbon audits with lots of hospitals in, uh, in France. So uh, that, that was the, the, you know, a methodology pretty, uh, pretty interesting, uh, also in French. Uh, so as we are in a French speaking province, it was uh, far more easier to, uh, to work with that. So we took the reference re a year 2019-2020, uh, so just before COVID, uh, but we did the analysis uh, between November 21, uh, uh, 2021 and May 2022. Uh, and we decided also, uh, as Benoit uh, mentioned it, uh, so the, the CIS de Laval is a pretty big institution. So uh, we based our inter intervention on seven uh, installations representing the different uh, activities, missions of of the, the organization. So there was an hospital, a nursing home, a local community health and social services center, a youth rehabilitation center, uh, a ambulatory and administrative center, a rehabilitation hospital, and a youth education, uh, one youth reeducation home. Next slide, please. So the methodology, uh, we, we, we worked together and we developed it uh, together. So the, the, the main uh, uh, part was, uh, the first part was to identify all the stakeholders, so uh, uh, internally and externally. Uh, some people from the, uh, the, the city were involved in this. Uh, also, we we uh, just uh, you know draw the the framework of the study. Uh, if some of you uh, already did uh, carbon audits, you know you can go in lots of directions, and uh, it's pretty important at the beginning just to know exactly to what extent you want to do the the carbon audit. Um, so uh, there was a big part of collection of data. Uh, so it was pretty uh, pretty. Um, uh, um, you know, so uh, a main part of the, the project just to collect the data and some of these data had to be uh, to uh, so everybody everything was analyzed but some of the data had to be uh, we had to work with them because it was not necessarily in the you know the 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 way we uh, we had uh, the best way to use it to do the carbon audit so there was a lot of time uh, uh, involved in the the data analysis then um, we wanted to work in an participative approach so uh, the idea was to do the carbon audit and then to identify you know some actions that could be put in the sustainability action plan of the uh, of the CIS de Laval but the idea was not to you know for uh, the consultants to decide which action should be put so we we work together with uh, each subcommittee so the ones that uh, uh, Benoit showed earlier and uh, it was pretty interesting because uh, it was a way also to just educate the people to make them understand exactly what is a carbon uh, um, uh, audit and uh, for them to understand more you know uh, uh, how uh, different actions could uh, reduce the GHG emissions at the end. So we did a report and then uh, also an extrapolation to the entire uh, institution. As uh, I was saying, there was only seven buildings that were uh, involved in this uh, in this audit. So next slide, please. So the perimeter of works, that's an image you probably, uh, uh, most of you have seen, it's something coming from the uh, NHS. So uh, we were focusing, of course, on scope one and scope two emissions. In scope one, I want to just say that we were uh, pretty interested also by the anesthetic gases coming from the hospital. So we uh, we estimated them also. And then on scope three, we wanted to, uh, you know, to focus on, on um, uh, transportation, uh, we were only able to work on, you know, transportation from home to work uh, uh, of the employees, but also for, uh, you know, all the uh, the work uh, transportation during the day. Uh, it was a bit difficult. We wanted to do that, but it was a bit difficult in COVID times to uh, estimate 
uh, the transportation of the, the public, uh, you know, the visitors and eventually the, uh, uh, so the patients. Uh, also, we focused a lot on medical devices uh, and uh, tried to, uh, uh, to get data from transportation of the suppliers. But again, it was pretty, uh, uh, it was not the easiest part because uh, suppliers were, were not there uh, at that time. So pretty difficult to get information from them. Next slide, please. So this is the, the, the result of the, the carbon audit. Uh, so really a, a resume of the, the results. So the, the seven facilities uh, under the study uh, emitted uh, um, 50,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent uh, uh, during that uh, uh, you know, year. Uh, and um, if we extrapolate that to the whole CIS de Laval, uh, it's uh, around 90,000 uh, uh, tons of CO2 equivalent annually. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, the data is uh, divided uh, between the scopes like this. So 7% for scope one, 3% for scope two, and then 90% for scope three, which is, you know, something really close to what we can see in other institutions uh, across the world. So uh, the results we wanted also to just to present them uh, uh, between you know uh, not necessarily by scope one two three but uh, you know by uh, something that is more uh, you know uh, uh, common to uh, to people so energy uh, for example is around ten percent of the uh, GHG emissions so the transportation uh, uh, around forty percent which which is really close to uh, what is for the whole province of Quebec. Uh, then we've got the supplying, uh, uh, supplying. So that's uh, around forty-two percent of the uh, of the emissions. Uh, again, in this we uh, we put uh, food. Uh, we put also uh, medication. So pharmaceuticals, it's a, a pretty big chunk. And then anesthetic gases, you know, uh, a bit less than one percent of the, the the GHG emissions. So next slide. So the, the, the interest of the, the carbon audit was to, you know, to present also the information by side. So we could take one institution and just present all the data. But next slide, please. We could also just present, you know, by source. So having all the, the, the institutions, the, so the, the buildings we were focusing on and then showing uh, the different uh, um, uh, data. Uh, um, so the same data for, for different in, uh, buildings. Uh, and then it was, uh, you know, possible to make comparisons eventually. So next slide. Mm -hmm. So th thank you, Jérôme. So within this um, the study, after the first uh, information and all the uh, all the new information that we gathered, with this helping us having uh, like a diagnosis of our impact, uh, it also gave us uh, some uh, food for thoughts to how we can reduce our impact. So in within the different. Um, uh, categories that were shown, we had some uh, ideas that were validated with our uh, subcommittees to make sure that we can, that our uh, solution that can be implemented within a realistic timeline. So for example, for food, only reducing the consumption of the red meat would impact uh, like all, almost two, 2,000 equivalent ton of CO2, which is like more than two percent of our impact annually we and this for example this example doesn't have a lot of impact in terms of investment required energy we could invest in the gas boilers but we also could only lower the thermostat by some degree so to have a less impact and anesthetic and anesthetic gases could be a target also to have a quick in, quick impact. So we had, in terms of traveling, um, good example, uh, the obligation was not to put a solution to make sure that everybody can, uh, can access like active transport or public transport, but only targeting within a perimeter or of five or 10 kilometers for, with the different means would impact quite, uh, quite well the our global impact in terms of um, of the carbon footprint so we had example and many others element that 
were suggested by the professional, evaluated by our teams in terms of feasibility. Our next step was to review our priority with this, uh, those uh, uh, learn, learning that we had, for example, for myself, having 40% on purchase impact uh, on the purchases, having an impact on CO2 was a, a quite a, a good learning. So how we can change our priority in terms of investment, uh, look for some opportunity we had since the, um, since the, um, the the projection of the study, uh, work done with Recyc Quebec in terms of recycling, we work done with uh, other uh, third partners to be able to have solution that we could improve our our uh, our portrait. We had to uh, the implement, evaluate the cost, review the our uh, of action plan, and present it to the upper management to make sure that they are uh, okay with the the modification. And uh, with those numbers, it was easier, quite easier to present why and the impact of the solution that we had. And also, we had uh, our objective was was also to work within. Uh, create some metrics because we had, for example, uh, X tons of equivalent uh, CO2 projection within a long-term care. So by calculating by uh, square, um, square feet or uh, uh, square meters, number of bed or number of, um, of employee would uh, create some matrix to see, for example, in the province of Quebec, uh, by each bed, uh, each bed in the long-term care services provide each X uh, tons of uh, equivalent uh, CO2 to have an idea to uh, to make sure that we can have a broader idea of the impact for the uh, for organization. So I want to thank you everybody for for the the opportunity and. Um, uh, uh, I hope uh, it was clear enough with <laughs> even with my accent in French. So uh, thank uh, thank you for everybody. Thank you. thank you so much, Benoit and Jerome. That was terrific. And I think this is actually a real milestone because this is the first time this has been publicly presented. It's the first carbon audit, including scope three, that is done by a hospital in Canada. And it's the first time that we're seeing what the priorities are. So thank you so much. Uh, you've identified your priorities. You've identified some of the action items. And I'm looking forward to the next steps as you, as you continue through this journey. So yes, questions, please, if you have them, we'll, we'll uh, address them at the end. So thanks so much. So our next uh, group of speakers will be talking about the new St. Paul's Hospital project in Vancouver, BC. Uh, this hospital has been uh, specifically designed for sustainability, resilience, wellness, and with the goal of becoming as carbon neutral as possible. I'm going to name off the speakers, and the speakers will identify when they're going to be speaking, but I'm, I'm just going to acknowledge the speakers uh, now. Mark Dano, um, Dagno, he is the director with the new St. Paul's Hospital Project. We have Mark Trudeau, who's a principal at AME, and Zlatko Puljic, who's a principal at AME. And we have Robin Hawker, who's the associate principal and technical lead at Introba's Climate Resilient Practice in Canada region. So welcome the team from St. Paul's. Thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to kick us off here. Um, really, uh, this team with me is a portion of our team. Um, and we'd like to thank the uh, CCGHC for the opportunity to share our story. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude that I live, work, and play on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, I'd also like to thank, um, you know, the design disciplines who are not here, um, because there would be our entire team here, uh, the project team and the city of Vancouver and everyone who had a stake in contributing to this vision. The vision in a nutshell is <clears throat> 
reduce our carbon footprint, being sustainable, adapt uh, to climate change and build in redundancy in all systems to mitigate against system failures, resilience, and promote wellness with the built environment. So our goals to start <clears throat> with this project uh, that we wanted PHC, uh, Providence Healthcare, and the new St. Paul's to be a leader in resilience and sustainability. Um, we wanted to improve climate resilience of built systems, natural systems, and human systems. Integrate the climate change adaption lens into strategies and planning and engage with stakeholders early. Um, objectives. Uh, maximize resilience of infrastructure and buildings, maximize the health and vigor of natural systems in the face of climate change. Uh, and then, the, so our priorities were to um, climate, climate robust infrastructure, healthy and vigorous natural areas and green space. Um, NSPH, New St. Paul's, was the first to in, in British Columbia to uh, put this in play and now is a resource for healthcare redevelopment projects around BC. Um, and with that, I will give it over to Robin who uh, will get into climate resilience and part of our journey there. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so we felt really privileged to work with the new St. Paul's project team because of their dedication, uh, as Mark covered, to integrating climate resilience throughout the full design process. Uh, so why is climate resilience important for hospital design? Ultimately, a more resilient hospital is better prepared to protect the health and safety of patients and staff, and it supports community health and wellness more broadly. Uh, the more recent climate projections indicate that we will continue to see more frequent and extreme weather events across Canada, alongside more gradual changes in temperatures, precipitation patterns, and sea levels. So building a climate resilience lens into the new St. Paul's Hospital uh, will make it better prepared to stand up to these future conditions by maintaining critical operations in the face of shocks and stresses, uh, returning to normal operations quickly, maintaining and enhancing healthy livable spaces, and doing all of this at the same time as reducing operational and embodied uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So in this presentation, we'll touch on the process taken to integrate climate resilience into design, the key resilient design strategies, and we'll highlight the benefits that resilient design elements can have for health and wellness more broadly. Uh, so as you can see on the slide here, uh, this summarizes some of the early work that was done right at the start uh, of the hospital design process. Um, we are already seeing the effects of climate change in our communities across Canada. You no doubt have been experiencing these events in your own areas, but some of the events in BC over the past few years have included an unprecedented heat wave, catastrophic flooding, and more severe wildfire seasons with significant impacts to air quality across Western Canada. And so realizing this, uh, climate change resilience was built into the hospital design process right from the start with a set of climate risk and vulnerability assessments, design workshops, and engagement with the City of Vancouver during early planning phases. Uh, the process reviewed 12 climate risks overall and identified five key risks to address through design. These risks of focus, uh, which you can see on the screen, were warmer temperatures and more severe heat waves poor air quality events linked with wildfires, more intense rainfall and stormwater flooding, uh, rising sea levels, increasing coastal flood levels, and more severe windstorms. Uh, and of these five risks, sea level rise, poor air quality, and heat were identified as the top three risks that drove design. Next slide, please. So we worked with New St. Paul's hospital team to establish a process for integrating climate resilience as part of the design compliance review. Uh, as this was a pretty new process, we worked with other team members uh, from the compliance team, uh, the project team with Providence Healthcare, and key members from the design team to co-design the process to fit within the existing compliance process. 
Uh, so a key objective was to tie resilience compliance with the stated requirements under the project agreement uh, in order to set a clear line of accountability. We also wanted to streamline the resilience compliance process to avoid extra work for compliance and design teams, while also ensuring clear lines of communication between all parties. And as climate resilience was embedded throughout different design disciplines for the project, creating a process that would allow each discipline to review and report on climate resilience within their scope of work was really important. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to facilitate this, we designed two key tools to serve as platforms for collaborative resilience compliance documentation. Uh, so you can see on this slide here, the first tool is a climate resilience checklist that was passed back and forth between the design and compliance teams to document compliance at each stage of design review. So 50%, 70%, 90%, and 100%. Uh, the first step was... Uh, for teams to review the uh, resilience requirements directly from the project agreement. Uh, then this was filled out by the design team to document how they were meeting those requirements. It was then sent over to the compliance team who reviewed the design team's work uh, and then uh, commented on uh, the degree to which they found this within their own compliance review. And our resilience team provided overarching support, oversight, and coordination for this um, sort of broad effort across the compliance team. Uh, the checklist was then passed back and forth uh, iteratively between the design and compliance teams until measures were considered acceptable for that level of design. And then everything was summarized in a resilience design report to tell the narrative of how climate resilience was being addressed at that phase of design. Next slide. Uh, so you can see on the screen just a high level overview of some of the key climate resilience measures that were incorporated into the hospital design as an outcome from this process. Uh, so I'll summarize these and then Zlatko Puljic with AME Group will speak in more detail to the mechanical components. Uh, but for heat mitigation, the design team adjusted building orientation to reduce south and west exposures uh, to reduce solar loading during extreme heat events. They designed the cooling system for warmer future temperatures, installed exterior building shading, and planted more than or planned to plant more than 300 trees on site to reduce heat and flood risk. They included 17 green roofs to reduce urban heat island effects and increased insulation and, and planned for airtight construction with controlled ventilation. Uh, for flood management, uh, they plan to site the energy center, backup generator, and other critical equipment above the 500-year coastal flood level. Uh, they plan to install floodgates at low-lying building entrances and parkade entrances uh, to prevent below-grade flooding during a coastal storm event. Uh, and they also included uh, a larger sanitary sewer tank with spare capacity to accommodate uh, floodwaters with a pump out in case of inundation. Uh, for managing uh, power outages and extreme storms, uh, the work here really focused on making sure the backup generators were as resilient as possible to future temperatures and conditions. And then for uh, managing air quality events due to wildfires, uh, this was addressed through the design of air handling units to accommodate more frequent uh, poor air quality events and including extra space for spare filters that would be needed during one of these events. So with that, I'll hand it over to Zlatko with AME Group to take a bit of a deeper dive. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I, I want to echo a little bit what Mark said. Uh, obviously, uh, can't take a credit for uh, a lot of things that was uh, part of the collaboration to to support the climate resilience. There's a lot of good fellas involved in this. And at the end of the day, somebody had to present it and it's us because our systems take the most of the space. So that was the reason why I'm presenting this. So uh, joke on aside is uh, we, we talk about the climate resilience and uh, obviously from a mechanical perspective, uh, the dealing with the heat waves, uh, the vision was uh, to support the building with the you know, to be to to be operational fully, uh, with no reduction in air changes or any reduction in functional programming, with uh, future weather files 2080. We did collaborate with the University of Victoria and uh, Pacific uh, Climate Institution Consortium to use at that time uh, uh, weather projections 
uh, to assess what uh, these uh, loads would be, and we uh, size our equipment accordingly. Obviously, everything what we've done has an impact on electrical and the other, the other uh, uh, design uh, individuals. Uh, from uh, an another aspect of climate resilience was obviously storms and heavy rains, so whole infrastructure, including uh, spare capacity of the storm systems, retention tanks, there, there's an onerous uh, rainwater management system to ensure that during uh, such a conditions, mm -hmm. in collaboration again with the city of Vancouver, uh, we are capable to deal with those uh, scenarios at, at the same time to avoid their overloading and uh, a city network, which, uh, is not designed for that either. Uh, then next item, I guess, would be air quality. Uh, and um, uh, these are all the climate resilience items. Uh, air quality, we, we do experience a lot of the uh, wildfires in the BC. So one, one of the things that definitely we wanted to address is to have uh, 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 provisions, I would say, for the carbon filters and uh, improving indoor air quality when it comes to removal of, of the smoke, uh, we, which can be uh, could be done with uh, active car uh, carbon carbon uh, filtration. Obviously, it takes in a place sizing all air handling system and everything else to overcome the static pressure of these additional filtration systems. So I I, I have to say, you know, even though this is pre this presentation is a lot about the climate scenario resiliency, uh, because we are acute care site, and just to put the things into perspective. This hospital is a 543 beds, and everybody who understands the classification in, in Canada in, uh, uh, of the hospitals, as the acute care site, this hospital is classified as A1. Everything over 350 beds is A1, and we got 543 beds. So I would say that one of those prides beside the, making sure that this vision of the climate resiliency will be a uh, achieved is really to have a resilient site on for many other aspects. And I think the COVID, the situation with the COVID is one of those things that contributed a lot uh, uh, on another resiliency measures, which are beyond the climate resilience and primarily for infection control, uh, which are beyond the uh, CSA standards and the standards that we follow in Canada. So I, I would say uh, some of those are, is really extensive air filtration we got uh, almost uh, close to 100 airborne isolation room, different kinds and the hybrid system. We got pandemic outbreak zone 16. So overall in a summary, if I would summarize from infection control uh, perspective is we almost can cover two thirds of the patient beds when it comes to uh, 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 outbreak modes and, and something that uh, could hit us similar to the COVID. Uh, another type of the resiliency that we were trying to achieve, uh, it's off-site uh, resiliency as well. And uh, we didn't want to put all, uh, all things in one basket. So we got multiple sources uh, when it comes to energy sources. Uh, we got uh, obviously extensive emergency generation, dual fuel sources, temporary external connections, everything what we feel is important for the site of this nature. And because we are in a seismic region and we design other buildings for the post-disaster, uh, we felt that that level of off-site resiliency is a crucial for us. And uh, lastly, on resilience, I could just say, you know, there is uh, internal re uh, resiliency and uh, res internal re resiliency is basically uh, a result of the uh, extensive redundancy on the systems, equipment, components, uh, uh, infrastructure with multiple risers, loop systems, spare capacity, etc. cetera. So uh, next slide. So going back to sustainability, obviously one of the big goals, you know, beside the climate resilience, beside the uh, healthcare, you know, and the service we are providing in infection control resilience, we still want to make our building, you know, uh, sustainable, which is a big part of uh, this presentation today is. So I would say if I, obviously it's not easy to do that in a minute or two, but uh, in a summary, uh, we, we achieved that facility heating energy use was already 5% renewable, uh, meaning we only need a 15% of energy during the peak winter conditions to come from external sources. The rest are really renewable internal so sources and roughly uh, anything beyond minus five, we, we are self-sustainable on the site. We don't need energy to support the heating energy on the site. Uh, our internal renewable resources were extensive and we tapped into it. We were utilizing benefits of 
simultaneous heating and cooling and any other process load. So which hospitals are very well known for it. We provide heating and cooling at the same time. Uh, well, uh, the rest of the heat recovery measures would be building exhaust, process sterilization, steam condensate recovery. But uh, I, I can rest to assure you is that we tap to in every single one we, we can. Uh, this did uh, indirectly result in a reduction of uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, I would say that uh, we are 75% uh, better in a reduction compared to the uh, lead uh, lead goal baseline. Obviously, we do have a mandatory requirement mm -hmm. here in BC uh, to uh, to uh, certify the building as a minimum as a lead gold. Uh, but uh, I would say these aggressive reductions were definitely a result of uh, uh, three main factors. Uh, one would be first one to attack, reduce the energy use through uh, multiple measures. And I, I, I could count up to over 25 and I don't want to go through every single one, but envelope, lighting system, controllability of the system, et cetera. Uh, second main, main, main thing would be extensive electrification of the site. And obviously we know that the BC, we, we are fortunate that our energy is very, very clean. So extensive electrification was the key part uh, in uh, re reduction of greenhouse gases. And uh, lastly is a premium equipment efficiency, obviously, which comes with a capital cost, but the vision was uh, big right. and, uh, and we, uh, we went for the, the, the most efficient equipment that at this point uh, technology can offer on, on the market. And I, I would just say, you know, on the chillers, we went through magnetic bearing. There's nothing more efficient than that. And lastly, uh, I guess is uh, we know we are not 100% for uh, 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 our reduction is not 100%. So we got a path to the carbon neutral. And I, I would say, uh, you know, in a summary, path to carbon neutral, we, we had uh, uh, three, three, three roads, and one road is basically uh, energy share uh, between us and City of Vancouver Network. Uh, the other road is uh, uh, doing some preliminary agreement with the local utility for securing renewable natural gases and uh, infrastructure ready for renewable energy generations, <laughs> PV panels. That would be it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lako and Robin. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with the next two slides. Um, this this last slide is about wellness. It's about um, building that in our environment. And and um, some of the key elements, I, there are many, I'm, I'm just going to hit a couple. Um, it's the landscaping and outdoor elements designed um, for wellness. So a public realm that encourages healing functions and enhances the pedestrian experience. Um, a wellness walk that provides opportunities for quiet reflection, healing, and leisure with um, thoughtful lighting design, seating arrangements, and, and a therapeutic landscape tree canopy. Um, and plus a, a, a large civic plaza to provide a community space for exercise and public gatherings uh, and, and things such as farmers markets and um, all sorts of engagement with the community and our and our uh, patients. Um, then extensive throughout this uh, massive building, we have um, a green roof system. We have rooftop gardens uh, for for staff and for patients in many different areas. And uh, one uh, for a critical care um, garden that has all the amenities there. And then um, also <clears throat> uh, as part of our, our, our planning, we had to think about green mobility transportation options. And uh, um, there are many, but I'll say we have car share, programs we have uh public or easy access to public transit cycling center we have a cycling center for our staff uh, public bike share spaces 
walking improvements, as I mentioned, many EV charging stations uh, for um, electric cars with uh, room to grow, always uh, flexibility for future. We have car share spaces, additional pick up and drop off spaces and carpool services. Um, moving sort of more into uh, the hospital, we have um, opportunities for indigenous healing and ceremony available throughout the campus and in the campus with um, features like all, na all nations sacred space and traditional medicine garden. Um, and then for all, all other face, we have a meditation room that's a all nations or all face can come and um, have have some some space, some quiet time. We have spiritual garden and we have a chapel. Um, and also then thinking about how this uh, all comes together, <clears throat> as Laco mentioned, uh, we, we have a lot, we've leveraged technology to help us sort of bring this into operations. And with all this uh, resilience and um, robust infrastructure, we need a, a way to drive it. We need a, a roadmap there. So with that, I'm gonna go into the last slide. Um, these were, I guess, our challenges and learnings. Um, quickly, the, the key is, the owner has to be the champion. Have to have buy-in and sponsorship from the organization, executive leadership throughout the organization. Um, then have a vision um, and engage um, stakeholders early and support that vision throughout. Uh, the importance of climate resilience and continuity throughout the full project design maintaining that passion in your project team and your consultant team and your partner to to always keep an eye on on that and, and always keep uh, passion there um, that it is a lot of work um, it, it, and uh, it, you know it can be put to the side because <laughs> there's a lot of other planning and priorities um, but uh, have to maintain that passion um, and then clearly establish the priorities, embed them in the project agreement and promote cross-discipline co collaboration. And uh, one thing, I guess, uh, lastly, I think maybe if we, with hindsight, maybe would have been a little bit more prescriptive in our uh, climate objectives. Um, and that's where we're sharing with others. I mean, that, that comes from being the first. Um, so thank you for again for this opportunity. And I think we'll go into questions. Thanks so much. Wow, we've had some great presentations today. And this is wonderful to hear about the new St. Paul's initiative and all the um, initiatives that you've actually undertaken to make the facility more resilient. We do have a couple of questions. And I'll start off with there are a number of questions that relate to this. And this is um this is the, um, the question about electrification of the facility. Um, there are questions that why not proceed to 100% electrification versus 20% fossil fuels that are currently in, in the plans. Victor Leung asks that. Um, an anonymous uh, question in a province with abundant hydroelectricity, why is the new St. Paul's only powered with 85% hydro? Um, and is it possible to build a new hospital that uses 100% renewable energy and is not dependent on at all on fossil fuels? Question from Larry Barzali. So um, New St. Paul's team, do you have some suggestions for those? Um, just questions? quickly before that's answered, I just want everyone to be aware it is 10 o'clock now. So anyone that needs to drop off, please leave. Um, hopefully our St. Paul speakers can stay on to answer these couple of questions. And we will be sending out the recording so that everyone can be answered. Um, and yeah, take it away St. Paul's if you are able to stay and answer those. Okay, so the, the first question, 100% uh, electrification. And um, 
So yeah, we made decisions um, and, and Zlako can sort of give more detail to this after, but we had to make some decisions um, early on. Um, there, there are other risks involved in uh, when we were um, sort of um, in, in that stage of planning, our hydro network is is uh, is planned to be upgraded, but it's um, it's not a seismically resilient uh, station. And so we thought, well, we might lose power. So to be resilient, we 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 um, connected to gas as well. Like Zlatko said, we have a path to uh, carbon neutral. We have options to um, use renewable natural gas. Uh, and we have options to connect to a neighborhood energy in the future. So those are our things. And it's just about flexibility, uh, redundancy in, in our fuel sources. That's why we um, kept that 20. And Zlatko, if you want to chime in with anything else. No. Okay. No, no. Um, sounds good to I, have it. I, I would say you summarize it very well, Mark. You know, obviously, you know, uh, there was a region and everything else, but uh, at the same time, there were schedules we had to think about. They were thinking about limitation of utility at the same of the uh, at the time when we were doing. So we, we were trying not to put everything in the same basket, making sure that this project goes along. So uh, that was uh, one of the reasons. That's why we did uh, push for the old three paths. Uh, which uh, uh, definitely can get us over there. Uh, and the most attractive one was definitely energy share because we would contribute not just to us offsetting the greenhouse gases, but also limiting the gases, greenhouse gases emission for the city of Vancouver. Okay, thank you. The uh, next question from Harry Vandermeer. Did you estimate the capital cost premium and also the difference in total cost ownership, capital plus operating between the standard gold lead standard over the lifetime of the facility? And this is for St. Paul's. Okay, um, did we estimate the capital? Also, so, uh, between gold, lead gold and okay, uh, I, I can okay, Zach will continue. Okay, this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I might not gonna be able to throw every single number when it comes to capital cost, but we did as a part of the uh, uh, analysis greenhouse gases, uh, life cycle, operating cost. We did uh, uh, involve the uh, premium uh, and uh, understanding, you know, what that gives us, and uh, you know, what 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 are the benefits from uh, uh, multiple aspects. Obviously, greenhouse gases reduction was a priority for us, and yes, that uh, obviously pre premium was uh, pretty high. Uh, but this is where I agree with Mark. There was a vision, right? So uh, to do everything what we've done, it did cost us quite a bit of the money. But analysis were done. Uh, we were not going prescriptively, just writing. We would like to that. Uh, we would like to have this, and not knowing uh, how much that roughly would cost us. And I, I believe I can speak financially too much, but we almost met the ceiling what we priced before we got to the, with this job, which which it says we did a thorough job understanding how much this is going to cost us. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question okay. from Miles uh, so Sargent. The last uh, or. One of the last questions here, uh, diesel generators, uh, we, we we do have uh, more than hydro can provide actually in our space right now. Um, we have 12 megawatts of generator with what we have. Um, going full power uh, electrification, uh, I think we would have, I'm not sure where we would have been, but it was a lot more. And you know, we have a, a footprint um, that that we that the constraints of a footprint in in the building. So on that one, I, I think uh, I think the project that we're looking at the project diesel generators, we consider that as emergency generation backup power. So this is resilience on the power loss. But or looking at the project, we are talking about the normal operations when there is no catastrophic event. So we wouldn't be relying on generators powering the pieces of equipment. So yes, with generators, we can do what we need to do. 
Uh, obviously, once you power the diesel generator, it's no different whether you're burning the natural gas on the boilers or the diesel on the boilers or diesel on the generator, diesel generator. Actually, diesel generators are only 30 to 40 percent uh, 40 efficient. But if you are talking about events with no power losses or anything like that, then uh, then it's it's definitely something that would not be involving the generators, right? Okay, thank you. We have uh, one other question from Miles Sargent uh, uh, asking a question about the supply chain and whether that has been considered in your greenhouse gas uh, reduction strategy. Oh, okay, we're, we're skipping down here. Um, how, where is the supply chain, where is the supply chain one? Uh, I, I'm seeing one about engagement of workers and staff. <laughs> It, yeah, went, it went into the answered section. Oh, but no, okay. Not all of it was answered, so I'm answer, asking it. Okay. So it's basically a question about if, mm. you're, if your uh, goal is to be net zero, how is the supply chain being addressed in, um, in this quest? Knowing that supply chain that was just presented uh, by the Laval folks um, was 90% of the emissions 90 percent of the, the emissions uh, i i'm not, I'm not sure, sure. sure. we uh, uh, sorry, I, I, okay so 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 a bit of feedback there sorry yep are we okay now Yes, that's good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so the our numbers when we talk about the greenhouse gases reduction, we're talking only about the on-site generation. We're not talking about the supply chain. Like what uh, French guys did, that this is way bigger on another level because they're going all the way to almost embodied carbon and the supply chain and everything else. Uh, the numbers that we were presenting were primarily uh, operational numbers, which is on-site generation. Okay, right. so scope one is two, right. basically. Yeah. I hope that explained that. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, and and I do have a question for Benoit. I know Jerome had to leave, but Benoit, um, do you think, or is there a way that you could um, let leadership know that this is an option that they should be considering, what you did at Laval? Um, should other hospitals be considering the approach that you took uh, to identify what the emissions were, scope one, two, and three? Is there a way to convince them? I think presentation like today help. It, it publicize what we've done. It's it's part of the mandate. We've already met with the upper management of the organization, which is quite um, happy with the result and want to. Uh, it, it helped them have a picture of the situation and uh, put this, those criteria in place. We want more and more to be uh, uh, sustainable development, be part of the decision making of a decision with uh, its construction, review of a process, everything. Uh, we want to build a culture. Also, we presented to the province of Quebec, um, other institution, and there's already something in uh, work uh, that we're working on with our partners to to put that in place in terms of the long term view to take that into a, to do those evaluation. But those evaluation take times and resources. It's money. It's time. It's time consuming. So I don't know if we need all organization always need to do those diagnoses or like I said at the end with some pyramid. Um, um, matrix that we could have a broad idea of our impact because the idea is not to pinpoint the exact number of the, the the impact but have an idea and also when we put something in place to measure the impact of it so we plant x, tree, x numbers of trees what's the impact we change a process which uh, reduce the consumption of our um, Material, medical me, me devices, what's the impact? So just have an idea of it. It's already a big step of what we had before. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And if we still have folks on the line, which we do, uh, there's one additional question for St. Paul's, uh, for the new St. Paul hospital speakers. How will the healthcare workers staff be engaged in the next phases going forward? For instance, around the topic of climate champions, are there plans to facilitate engagement through appointing FTE positions to oversee such work? Uh, yes, I, I'd like to say first that um, our employees, our, um, our staff has been engaged throughout even uh, prior to us having a proponent on board to design and build this um, facility. Um, in, in, in workshops and developing strategic plans for it. Um, because Vancouver has a number of health authorities or in the greater Vancouver uh, region, um, we have shared resources in like we do have FTEs we can access um, through a through a coalition of, of our authorities um, who are um, experts in, in climate change and develop plans and, and and that's the folks I was saying we, we share with them they they bring us um, sort of the high level and we share our learnings with them and then they bring that back and, and develop it further um, so and anyone in uh, our health authorities can join uh, I forget the full name of it it's the green leaders uh, initiative is um, and um, yeah, they look at things such as supply chain, waste management, recycling, all sorts of things like that. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of engagement for staff. If people are interested, and we still have people on the line, uh, we have a question to the uh, St. Paul design team. Thanks for that fascinating presentation and amazing design work. I'm just wondering about the use of quote unquote, renewable natural gas, according to their own statistics, the vast majority of what Fortis will be selling as RNG will actually be LNG, maybe 11% um, will be RNG by 2032. Is there a way to modify or retrofit the energy center design to go back to 100% electric? Uh, yeah, just wait. wait, wait, wait. Okay. Okay, yes. like a uh, short answer is yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, electrical infrastructure, or when it comes to generation, domestic uh, generation, is uh, we got the means of uh, switching that to fully electric. As I said, the paths were mutual, many paths, and it wasn't just uh, going fully electric. It was also share energy with the city of Vancouver and some renewable uh, energy uh, generation on the site with the PV, PV panels. And uh, I would like to clarify the question about why you're heating with the natural gas. As I already stated, and maybe it was not that, that clear in the, in the presentation of the three minutes, we don't heat the building with uh, with the natural gas because uh, we rarely see the conditions below the minus five. And as I stated, minus five and above, we are self-sustainable. But natural gas presently is going towards the use to uh, produce the sterile steam. And we got the, one of the biggest medical devices reprocessing uh, departments. And at the, at the time when we were designing, there were limitations on a BC Hydro infrastructure to uh, uh, pick up that load of another three and a half megawatts. And that's the one of the reasons why we had to bring the gas to the site, one of the main reasons. Thank you, that's a good clarification. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just that, uh, that infrastructure, there are plans to um, build a seismically resilient uh, substation uh, near, our, near our facility. Um, but that's um, not concrete yet. And so when that does happen, I'm sure, uh, well, we do have the flexibility and the uh, folks then will be able to make those uh, decisions at that time. Well, I think this has been a terrific conversation at the end of, of several great presentations. And thank you so much for everybody for joining. And uh, for the people who attended, uh, I learned lots. I'm sure you did as well. We have two leaders now, one on the West Coast and, and one in Quebec, on where we can learn lots of things to move forward with mitigation and, and resilience activities in, in the healthcare sector. So thanks so much for everybody. Um, Autumn, do you have any uh, last words for closing? 
No, I just want to say thank you, everyone. Thank you to our presenters and everyone who attended today. I think this was a, we had a great turnout and I look forward to sharing the recording with everyone. Thanks folks. Cheers.